Happy days are here again, here again, here again. Happy days are here again. So we're back to do another video live stream. This time we're going to be covering combat, the actual process of running a combat and I don't advise anybody to do this at home. Do not live stream and show somebody how to play four characters and some monsters or a monster at the same time because it's going to be really confusing and hopefully I don't botch it all up. But if you're re-watching this video at a later date and you're not part of the live stream, please look down in the description. In the description you will find the start time for this video rather than my sound check and all of my introduction. Uh, for those of you who are here during the live stream, I will answer questions as I go. I won't just answer questions near the end. I'm going to try to run through the combat process and how it works um, pretty much exclusively and try and do that as much as I can and try not to get distracted. But I, I, I'm also aware that there's a good chance I might get distracted and that's fine. Um, so ask your questions and if they come up and I spot them, I will respond to them. Okay, so we're going to get started. Hi, welcome to How to D&D. My name is Fred Wheeler and today we're going to talk about Dungeons and Dragons 5e. In fact, we're going to show you how to run your own combat for Dungeons and Dragons 5e. Now, I expect this will be helpful to players but also Dungeon Masters because I'm going to be playing four different characters and the monster in this particular case. And yes, that just sounds stupid and it probably is and I probably shouldn't be doing that. But um, I thought I would do another workshop on combat. I've done them in the past, and I think they've had a good reception. And so I'm going to try to keep doing them uh, so that people can see the process, or at least how I do the process. It might not be the process for everybody, but it's certainly going to be the process for somebody. And you've got to see somebody doing it, right? Okay, I'm going to be using some of the pre-made characters you can find in the Dungeons & Dragons starter set. So I'm going to be using the Cleric from the Dungeons & Dragons starter set. I'm going to be using the fighter, and I believe this fighter is the noble. I think it's the noble. I certainly hope it's the noble. Yes, it's the noble. It's the one with the, the great axe. We're using that one. And I'm going to be using the uh, cleric. Now I'm going to, and the wizard, um, all from the Dungeons and Dragons 5e starter set. Um, I'm going to focus or try to focus my efforts on the cleric so that you can see how a cleric is run. Um, that doesn't mean I'm going to do everything, I'm only going to focus on the cleric, but uh, my focus will be primarily to try to give you an idea of how a cleric will, year, um, will work and how to use their spells and essentially just sort of how to, to um, navigate with them. So that is my intention for today. So we will bring up the, the battle mat and we will get started and hopefully this is useful to somebody out there. Okay, it should be coming up right now. And by all means, if you have feedback, questions, pop them into the, the chat box as I go. There we go, it's popped up. All right, so here we go. Here's our first situation. I'm going to, as the Dungeon Master, you normally would describe your location. And I wouldn't necessarily put out a map first. I'm just putting out the map because I'm doing a video. Um, and I've got dice and I've got monsters ready. But I wouldn't necessarily do that straight away. In fact, this monster will take it away. For those of you who can see it, that's what we're going to be using today. I would describe my scene. So you come across a jungle ruin. It looks like an old temple of some kind. There's four pillars. One of them has been broken completely and collapsed. There are some structures around the temple area or the main temple area that look like they have degraded over time. Everything is made of stone. You can see some strange snake-like creatures or statues uh, decorating the temple in each four, all four corners. One of them has fallen over and, and it seems to be crumbled from time. There's a lot of uh, overgrowth, trees, stuff like that. What do you want to do? And this is usually what I would present to my players. And often they will say, we want to move sneakily. We want to be stealthy about this. We want to move up. We don't know. We want to make perception checks. So let's start with a perception check. And I'm going to use the cleric as for making this perception check rather than the rogue or anybody else. Uh, 
one of the reasons for doing that is because they have a plus three for their perception. So I'm going to roll my 20 sided dice and I add that 20 to three and that comes to 21. So 21 is pretty good. Uh, now I would compare that to a stealth check if there was a monster lying in wait. But actually there's no monsters lying in wait. And so how I describe this is you can see that there is lichen, it looks like it's a little bit slippery in some locations, there's some uh, loose stones. So I'll give them more information, but it doesn't mean that they have radar and that they can detect anything through a stone wall or that isn't actually visible. Or they can't hear or smell, and there's nothing to actually see, smell or hear right now. So I would just add to my description that I had before. Okay. So now here we got, uh, we've got we got everybody who will probably jump on the bandwagon and start asking to make a perception check just in case they can get higher than 21. Now as the dungeon master I recommend that you fall back on something like the, the passive perception. Passive perception should be on the Dungeons and Dragons 5e starter set pre-made character sheets and you use that. Don't, don't ask for them to make a roll, just use that. That is your, what you compare to whatever uh, stealth check might be taking place, if there's one at all. Okay, That's how you avoid the bandwagon of everybody wanting to make a, a perception check. Alright, so they said they wanted to be stealthy. And they all indicated that they want to be sneaky. So I'm going to get them to all make a stealth check. And I'm going to go through this bit by bit. I have some little tags up here to represent the different characters. I'm going to bring them down so they're a little bit closer so you can see them. We're going to start off with the cleric. So start with the cleric. Whoops, I'll try to make sure it's sort of reasonably straight for you. There you go. And I've already put the hit points on this uh, particular tag. So the combat is coming. So I roll my 20 sided dice. Now the problem with the cleric is it's going to get disadvantaged because it's wearing heavy armor. So I take a second dice. I'm going to roll both of those and take the lowest result. And unfortunately, the stealth modifier for our cleric is minus one. So I roll that. Okay, the lowest result was an eight. That makes it a seven. So seven is the, the stealth check for our cleric. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. So what I'll do is I'll write that on the tag here. And I'm just going to put it as ST for stealth. ST equals seven. Like so. And we're going to run through and do the same thing for all the other characters. So the fighter, bring that one down. He'll make a stealth check as well. Um, now this, the fighter's also got disadvantage, wearing heavy armor, minus one. So we'll have to bring that dice back. Well, two dice. Take the lowest result, they're both tens. So we'll take a ten. And minus one is nine. So I write nine on here for the stealth. Stealth equals nine. Tell me if you can't see the, the lettering. I'm hopefully I'm making this it's it's big enough. If it's not, I will use dice so that you can actually see the, the numbers. Um, probably a little bit clearer if I do it that way. In fact, I'll do that right now. Let's go. So we've got a seven and nine. Maybe that's a little bit clearer. Okay, next. Keep that dice because that one's a, quite a nice one. Uh, next we're gonna make another check. We'll do the rogue next. Now the rogue makes a stealth check, their modifier is a 7, they don't have disadvantage, they're not wearing heavy armour, so we'll bring that down, and we just roll this dice, 20 sided dice, I roll the 7 plus 7, comes to a grand total of 14, so stealth, stealth equals 14, alright, we're getting there, slow but surely, and I will bring in another dice to represent, so you can see it a bit more clearly, there we go, there's a 14, Excellent. All right, the last one. We need to do the wizard. So bring the wizard down. And the wizard rolls their dice. Their, their modifier is a 2. So I rolled a 17 plus 2 equals 19. So stealth is 19. It's 19. There we go. And to represent that, we'll get a 20-sided dice. A nice pink one, I think, in this case. And if I can find the 19, of course, you never find the 19 fast. Here we go. So those are the modifiers. Now these stealth checks, if half of them are successful or greater than the passive check or the active perception check, 
of a monster who might be in the area who's actually paying attention to danger, then the group, whole group is successful and they get to sneak up and all have surprise. If more than half the group, if more than half the group fail a check, okay, they don't, they get equal to or less than, then they all suffer, even if somebody did really, really well on their stealth check because the other, other members pull them down. That's the concept of the group check. And often you'll use a group check when you're setting up for a combat of some kind. In this situation, I don't have any monsters hidden. But if I was to compare it to the monster I'm going to be using today, which is actually an ogre, their passive perception is only an 8. And you can see that just about everybody scored more than 8. So a 9 is more than 8, 14, 15. So if there was a, an ogre paying attention in the temple area, they would be able to sneak up on the ogre. But the ogre is actually not, not there right now. So we'll take them away. So that's the first part. Okay, but we're not in combat. They decide they want to maneuver around and have a look around the different locations. Maybe they're going to um, check out around this corner and uh, they fan out a little bit. Whether it's uh, divided up into pairs, who knows, maybe they go together. Uh, they decide they're going to check out from both sides. There's an opening over here. There's, you know, broken statues and they could continue around. But it looks like there might be an entranceway from both sides. And it's up to them to decide which way they will go. It's at this point I want to bring something in. Now the players don't know that this is taking place. And there is a, an ogre in these ruins. And they start walking up the stairs. Okay? That's what, what's going to happen. There is a stone wall blocking view. So the only thing that could take place at this point is, one, nobody can see anybody. They might be able to smell each other. They might be able to hear each other. The ogre is not using stealth. It's just making doing, doing its rounds, looking for something else to eat. They are voracious in nature, an ogre. So they're just making their rounds. The players aren't really being stealth anymore because they're, they've split up, they're moving around. They've, they've really sort of tried to be as stealthy and quiet as they possibly could. Um, and I'm, I'm going to eliminate this for this part simply because it's going to be a lot more fun. Um, these are all level 1 characters and this, this ogre is challenge rating 2 so I expect it to um, unfold in a pretty painful manner. Uh, so as they are exploring around, when you're rummaging around an area it's going to be very hard to be quiet. Okay? If you're just standing at a distance and looking, that's different. If you're standing beside, behind total cover, you're in something that gives obscurity, whether that's light or heavy obscurity, it's a little bit easier. But once you start moving around, you're moving around a location that's slippery, got loose stones where you can make noise, I'm not going to bring stealth in. Okay? So they decide they're all going to, they had a discussion to decide, okay, we're going to go around here. As soon as you start talking, you've just given yourself away. So I'm eliminating the stealth from this situation right now. This thing, Ogre, comes up around the corner and they just happen to be com coming around the corner as well. So we've got a situation where there's no surprise. In fact, both of them were unaware of each other. And now we roll initiative. Very, very simple. I've already done videos where I showed you how to use um, surprise in the first round. So I don't want to replay that here. So let's roll initiative for each one. And starting off, I'm going to bring down Mr. Ogre's uh, tag. He's right here. I've got his hit points all ready to go. Now, there's no initiative modifier on the stat block for the Ogre. So you're going to use the dex modifier, which is minus one. So I roll my dice. I rolled a four. It's not very good. So that means grand total of three on initiative. And I'll put a three here. Hopefully, you should be able to pick that up on the screen. I'm going to put down initiative. I for initiative equals, well, it's not three, it's going to be minus one, so that's going to be two. So we're down to two. No, 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 it is three. Sorry, getting confused now, confusing myself. I told you it was a bad idea to try and do an entire combat yourself. Okay, all right, so that's the first one. Let's start doing the next character. So roll initiative for each one. And you're going to call out, look, please roll initiative. Um, this, this creature comes around the corner, looks surprised, but raises its axe or club. So there's an indication that there's some sort of violence about to take place. Now, 
you might allow them to have a discussion with it. Ogres do understand common and giant, so they could communicate with the party. But since this is supposed to be a workshop showing you how to run combat, I'm not going to get into that for today. Alright, so let's start with the wizard. Their uh, initiative modifier is a plus two. So I roll that. And I got a five on my 20-sided my dice. So two plus five is seven. So initiative, whoops, I just pulled up the rogue. Give me the fight. Was it? Give me it. Here we go. Two plus five is seven. There is our initiative. I'm going to just put it up here out of the way, so otherwise it's going to be very difficult. And we'll indicate it on the dice with a seven. Here we go. Hopefully that's a bit clearer. My writing is not exactly fantastic. Okay, next. Initiative modifier for the rogue is a plus three, so I roll a 20-sided dice. I rolled a three, plus three is six, so that's their initiative. So I equals three plus three is six, and we'll leave that up there. Now I'm going to change the order around after I've done all of the, the dice rolling. Okay, so six. Very, very simple. Keep going, and now we'll do the fighter. The fighter's initiative is only a minus one. So roll a 20-sided dice. I rolled a 1. So a grand 0. Man, it's got to be embarrassing when you get a 0 on your initiative. Certainly no, it would be an initiative. Um, I have this really bad tendency of rolling somewhere in the vicinity of between 1 and 2 on my 20-sided dice. And I think that's part of the reason why my players continue to come back to my table and nothing else. Okay. Uh, <laughs> right, next, let's go with the cleric. Minus 1 on their initiative. So roll a 20-sided dice. I rolled a 14, minus 1 is 13. So initiative 13. I equals initiative for 13. And that 8 sided dice isn't going to do us any good anymore. So we need a 13. So we need a 20 sided dice to better represent this, don't we? Where's my 13? There we go, 13. Not a lucky number, 13. Bad, bad luck. Bad luck, 13. All right. Now we've got all of our monsters laid out, and you can see from here that um, the scores are not in order. What we want to do is take all those scores and put them into some sort of order so it's clear who's going to be going first and who's going to be going last. The higher your initiative, the more likely you're going first. If your initiative is low, you're going to be going last. So let's start off with zero, so let's move the cleric. And we'll move the fighter over here, and they are on zero. Next lowest in the uh, in the collection is the ogre. So the three, we'll move that over here, like so. Three. Next is the six, followed by the seven, and the cleric is the thirteen, which is the highest. And so this is our order. We are going to start with the cleric. Isn't it funny? I was wanting to focus on the cleric in the first place. And as it happens, bingo, we've got it. All right. So there are a number of spells that a cleric can cast. And this particular cleric has access to light, sacred flame, or as it's fondly referred to as sacred mist, and then thermatology. Uh, I've also got bless, cure wounds, and I've picked up healing word, detect magic, shield of faith, and guiding bolt. For those of you who are wondering about the cleric in terms of how they function, when you get your pre-made character sheet out of the starter set, Aaron, you are not light. You're not late at all. We're, we're, we're cracking into it right now. When you get your domain, you get two spells. They don't count towards the number of spells you can prepare as a cleric. And the number of spells you get is your cleric level plus, plus your spell casting uh, modifier or your wisdom in this case because you're a you're a cleric so it's got a plus three and it's the first level cleric so three plus one is four so i get to add four additional spells to use for my cleric nice and simple all right so let's start taking some actions since the cleric gets to act first and we're not dealing with surprise because both of them were unaware of each other and they just bump into each other as they're coming around the corner. I'm going to have my cleric use a spell which is considered pretty awesome to have. Uh, it, it's actually called 
bless and it allows you to bless a number of individuals. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a four sided dice and I'm going to plant it right beside a couple of characters to represent the fact that they are blessed. And we're going to bless, and then I need to be within the range. So the spell requires you to be within 30 feet. I'm going to bless the fighter. I can do three. I'm not obviously not going to bless the ogre. That would be foolish. I'm going to bless the rogue. And I'm also going to bless the wizard. Now, why am I not blessing the cleric? I'll tell you why. Because I don't want to bless the cleric. I want to keep the cleric out of frontline combat. And the reason being is so I can avoid making concentration checks. Because bless is a concentration spell. And if the ogre decides to start hitting on the cleric, then I might, might lose bless. This is often a tactic that I use. You don't have to do it this way, but I often use that as my tactic. I will plant it on somebody else so they get the benefit rather than myself. And then I don't have to worry about um, being up close to benefit. Because unfortunately, I don't have an unlimited supply of hand axes to throw. And I don't do an awful lot of damage with a hand axe anyway. And I'm, I still figure I'm going to do better off if um, I can stay out of, out of reach. And I'm a first level cleric. I don't want to be hit and taken down. Because hopefully I'm going to be able to get the party up if I need to start casting Healing Word or Cure Wounds. Now one thing I did not mention at the very beginning is I have looked at the pre-generated character sheets. All of them have at least 5 gold coins or gold pieces. And so I decided that each, each of my characters here have purchased them a healer's kit, which means that they can all attempt to stabilize a dying creature. And I'm definitely going to use that if it comes into play. So, first action has been taken. And I'm going to use the big dice to re represent where I am in the initiative. I think maybe that's the, the smartest way. I'll put it right there. There's so many dice around. No, it's the big yellow one with the one on it. This is to indicate where we are in an initiative. Nice and simple. There's so many dice around, you must be completely confused by now. So four-sided dice represent they have bless. These dice simply represent what their initiative order um, initiative was, and I've placed them into order. Okay. Beg my pardons, I needed to drink. Doing a lot of talking. Okay, so let's move on to the next person. Wizard. We know that there's a creature there. The wizard gets to make a... a uh, an action and I'm going, going to go with the the tried and true action of hell let's cast a spell and the spell I'm going to use is called magic missile so that's for a first level uh, wizard it's only going to be 3d4 so I'm going to grab three of these dice now there was some a bone of contention on magic missile whether you are supposed to roll one dice and just multiply it by three or whatever the number of darts that you have and add one to each of the dice that are supposed to be rolled. I'm not going to get into that. I know players like rolling dice. So if it says 3d4, I'm going to let them roll three four-sided dice. And if they're casting it at a higher level, I'm going to let them roll whatever dice they want that's related to that rather than multiplying it. Okay, there's a lot of fun to be had by rolling dice, right? Okay, so move into a good position so you don't have to worry about something like cover. So 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Alright, standing on their own tag. Oh well, but a reasonable clear line of sight. Now with something like uh, large creatures, you would normally sort of apply cover if you can't see the entire creature. I think this is pretty pretty much fine, but anything that's larger than you, like large, huge, I don't usually apply cover bonuses because there's so much of the creature that can be seen. It doesn't matter anyway because I'm using magic missile and it doesn't require an attack roll, so that means no rolling any dice to hit. You just hit automatically. Each of these darts, you add one. So I roll my dice. I rolled a 3, I rolled a 2, and I rolled a 3. So that essentially means that I'm going to get to add 1 to each of those dice. So I'll add those dice up and then add 3 is the easiest way. So 3 and 3 is 6, plus 2 is 8, and then 3 again is going to be 12, 11. So 
11 hit points of force damage strikes our ogre. So I'm going to deduct those hit points from my ogre. It has now not got 58 hit points, not at all. Instead it has 48 hit points. 48? 48. Yes, 48. There we go. Alright, back you go. Alright, so reduced, reduced it a little bit. So now that the wizards had their turn, it's time to move on to the rogue. The rogue doesn't have anybody within five feet. It doesn't get advantage because it didn't have surprise. It's only a level one um, character, so it doesn't have the benefit of cunning action. So it can't hide, move to a location, hide, and then make an attack. So it's not going to get its sneak attack damage in this particular situation. I'm sure that will crop up as we progress. So what we're going to do is move them into a reasonable position so they can shoot. So 5, 10. The little halfling doesn't move very fast. 10 and 15. And I'm going to shoot from here and then I'm going to move back. In fact, I might even move further back that way. Yep, that's exactly what's going to happen. Alright, so I roll my 20 sided dice to hit. I'm going to be using my short bow rather than getting up close with a short sword. So I roll a 20 sided dice. I roll a critical. For those of you who are unaware of what happens when you roll a critical, a critical means you double the dice you would normally use for your weapon. You don't double everything, just the weapon dice. So it's actually a six sided dice. So short saw, um, short short bow, I've got one six sided dice, I need another one. I'm going to roll those and then I'm going to add my damage modifier for my bow. Well that was nice, it started off quite nicely for them. I got a three and a two which is five and add three is eight. So that is eight piercing damage on our ogre. Our ogre is getting pummeled. So 48 becomes 40. Not too bad. We'll work. It's working out alright. You getting worried about them. First level characters against a challenge rating 2. That just seems so unfair. Alright, moving back. 20, 25. Okay, that's all I can do with, with the, uh, the rogue. It's now the ogre's turn. So the ogre's going to make their, their move. Now, ogres are unpredictable. They're also incredibly stupid. And they're incredibly aggressive. So how you make your ogre react is up to you. I'm going to decide that its first action is to go straight after the little thing that looks like an easy target and pummel it with its great huge club. I know it's supposed to be a club in the, uh, the stat block and, I'm, and of course the miniature has got an axe. But just bear with me. So I move up, counting up my squares if I'm using a grid. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Now it's in reach of the wizard and the rogue and it's really up to you which one you go after. Both of them manage to cause quite a bit of pain to it so it's, it's a, totally up to you who you attack. I'm going to go after the rogue just because I feel like that would be funny. Um, the smaller, weaker character seems like a, a, a nice choice. So we're going to roll our attack with our great club. The uh, attack roll is made. I got a 7, which isn't very high, and I'm going to be adding a plus 3 for my uh, great club. So that is only going to be 13 to hit my little rogue. And guess what? My rogue has an armor class of 14, so it doesn't strike the target. Now for those of you who are wondering why, why Fred did you not go after the wizard? Well actually the wizard has a magical glowing aura around it because at the very beginning of the day before we went adventuring this particular wizard made the sensible choice to use one of their spell slots their level 1 spell slots to cast mage armor so their armor class is a 15 not something nice and low that makes them a lot squishier so yes that's why the ogre decided to go after the smaller weaker and easier target to start with Okay, but it didn't work, wasn't successful, let us move on. Uh, we're over here, i keep, got to keep moving that yellow dice, there's so many dice everywhere, I'm, I'm surprised you've, um, you even um, noticed what's going on. Oh, and I've been forgetting to use my, my bless, so every time I roll an attack roll I should be rolling the four side of dice, which is why I pulled it out in the first place. Sorry about that guys. Okay, so, done the ogre, 
Moving on to the fighter, this time I will grab the dice so I remember to do it. Get our fighter to move up behind, make their attack with a, a great axe, so pull out their great axe, make your attack roll. I've got Bless going, and i got a 17, and this dice, some four-sided dice you read the number from the top, and some dice you read it from the bottom. It just depends on the type of four-sided dice you've got. I've got a 3 and a 17, which comes to 20. That doesn't mean it's a critical hit for those of you who are thinking, okay, that means I get double uh, damage. No, it doesn't. So 20, and then I'm going to add my modifier, which is 5, which is 25. So it's going to hit the Ogre. The Ogre has an armor class of 11. It's very, very easy to strike. No problems whatsoever. And now I roll my damage. And that's a 12-sided dice. That's the big one. That's the big sucker. So we roll that. I got a 17. Uh, sorry, a 7, not a 17. I've got a 7 plus 3 is 10. So the ogre takes some 10 points of slashing damage from the axe. It's now on 30 hit points. So you can see, first level characters, we haven't got th through the first round of combat, and that ogre has almost lost half its hit points. Um... Presto, it's a, a really great club. 25 hits the moon. Yeah, well, it is a pretty... Yeah, I agree. It is. It's done a good job. All right, so we've gone to the bottom of the initiative. It's time to move back to the top of the initiative again. I'm going to move the dice, yellow dice, over, over the top section. Otherwise, I'm going to forget what's going on. Move that back over there. It's still got Bless going. And we'll continue through with our second round of combat. And it's the Cleric's turn. It's your decision at this point what you're going to do. You can move into close quarter combat and try it and attack it, or you can decide to do something else. And I'm going to use a spell. Um, something like Casting Light, you just touch it, it's easy. So I'm not going to cover that. But something like Sacred Flame, or as it's um, often described, Sacred Miss, uh, we're going to cast that. It's only an eight sided dice worth of damage because it's a cantrip. So I've got my eight sided dice ready to go. But I need to be successful, and it requires a dexterity saving throw. Now, uh, an ogre doesn't have a very high dexterity saving throw. It's a minus one. So the ogre does the rolling, or the DM, roll your 20 sided dice. I'm going to deduct one from that nine that I just rolled. That's an eight. And the spell casting DC for this particular cleric is 13. So you have to get equal to or greater than to be successful for the spell not to have an effect on you or not to have the full effect. So this means that Sacred Flame works. So I get to roll my Sacred Flame damage. And voila, I rolled a five. So that's five radiant damage on our ogre. And as you can see, it didn't have to worry about getting hit at at any time because I've stayed out of, out of range of the ogre. In fact, it's more interested in the other characters, which is awesome. I'm also going to position myself so I can move up just a little bit more just in case I need to start casting healing spells to, uh, to help the party out should things develop in some way. Alright, I'm going to have another glass of water. Aaron, I don't see this I don't see this as a competition between um, the Dungeon Master and the player's characters. Um, but I, I do appreciate you wanting me to win, but um, monsters are supposed to uh, cause a complication and perish. And I have no affinity to my monsters whatsoever. So if they perish, they did what they were supposed to do. And if they escape and come back to thought the player characters some other day, then so be it. I'm fine with that too. <laughs> okay. All right, so we're on to the wizard. Now the wizard's up close, not a good place to be. I'm going to make the sensible decision to disengage. Disengage means there's no attack of opportunity when I move away. Uh, and I'm and doing that so that I don't have to worry about getting struck by it. And also, most of my spells are up close. Uh, not up close, ranged spells. So it's it's not really a good, good idea to be up close. I could use a spell like Burning Hands, but unfortunately I've expended all of my first level a spell slots. The only thing I've got left is a cantrip, and um, I don't really want to use a cantrip. Ray of Frost isn't going to do me much good right now, not up close. It would be disadvantaged, so I'm not going to do that. So disengage, and five, 
10, 15, 20, 25, 30. So I don't get struck because I'm taking all precautions to avoid being struck as I leave the threatened space of the ogre. All right, we're moving on to the rogue. Now the rogue finally gets to use sneak attack, but it's not gonna be much good um, for those of you who can, can, he, can you even see the rogue? The rogue is over here. See, it's hidden by the camera. There. They don't have advantage, but there is an ally within five feet, so they get sneak attack damage, but they're carrying a bow. So I'm going to drop the bow, pull out the short sword, we're going to the short sword. The bonuses, I've also got bless because I cast that spell with the cleric, didn't I? So 20 sided dice and uh, 4 sided dice, roll that. What do I get? I got a 16 plus 3 is 19, plus my modifier for my short sword is 5, so that comes to 24. So grab some damage dice. So the short sword is a d6, and also get sneak attack. Remember, sneak attack. How much is my sneak attack? It says it on the sheet. For those of you who are wondering what it is. So once per turn, once per turn, not round, when you hit a creature with a dexterity based attack, and I'm using a short sword, a short bow, you, or you have advantage, you get an extra d4. So, a d6, d6, there we go. So got it, and I'm going to add my modifier. My modifier for this particular short short sword is a plus three. So roll my damage. I got a two and a two plus three for seven. Seven damage on our ogre. Our ogre's getting pummeled, absolutely smashed to pieces. All right, it's now twenty-five minus seven is eighteen. It's on eighteen hit points. And most of the group, most of the group hasn't taken any hit, um, any hit point damage. Have you noticed this? Isn't this strange? Level one characters facing a challenge two creature. Okay, all right. So it's made its attack. Moving over to the ogre. It's time for the ogre to have some fun. Remember that little runt still there. It's going to lift up that great club and try to slam it down and squash our rogue, because that's what it wants to do. Okay. Roll a 20 sided dice. I rolled a six. Man, I'm rolling terrible. Every time I roll for monsters, it's like I'm cursed. Am I cursed? I don't know. Uh, six plus six is the uh, the modifier for hitting. So it's only 12. And that rogue's got an armor class of 14. So 12 is not equal to or greater than 14. Okay, so the, the ogre doesn't hit. Again. Oh my gosh. Second round. Nothing. Does the ogre decide it's time to flee? No. I, th I, feel, I think ogres are stupid enough they would stay in the fight no matter what, thinking that they can win it over. Um, that's just how I would play an ogre. But we're not going to have it flee because that's just not fun. Okay? Uh, what's this? Um, you've got some questions here. Uh, Aaron, speaking from Fred, the, the DM's perspective, or Fred, the player's <laughs> perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm playing both of them right now. I've got DM and player um, envy. Um, presto, wizard with 15 AC is impressive, but it's uh, always a wizard, wizard's best spell is to run. Well, yeah, but you know, that's why you, you use your mage armor. Use your mage armor. Cast your mage armor at the beginning of the day. It lasts eight hours. Why would you not? Haha, -ha, I can't see the, the rogue. Yes, impossible mission. Rogue is over here. Okay, it's not gone. Okay, uh, let's keep going. Where was I? I did the did the ogre. It's time to move on. I'm getting distracted. <laughs> so on to the fighter. The fighter is here. We're going to bring our fighter round. I don't want to go too far around because it does actually open up the uh, the cleric if uh, the, the ogre decides to sort of go towards the cleric. But um, I don't think it's going to be too much of an issue. It could have gone round anyway. So I'm moving to this position because I just feel like it's more fun. I'm not using flanking rules for those of you who are wondering, Fred, why aren't you using flanking? Why aren't you getting them in, in line so they're flanking so you can get flanking, which is the advantage. It's a variant rule. I don't use advantage um, flanking simply because if the players have it and the dungeon master has it, um, it kind of cancels it out. And also too, you, as a general rule, the, the DM will have more monsters than the players do or more things to control. And so it's more of an advantage to me than it is to the players. And I've explained that to my players many times and they have agreed that uh, it's a bad idea. So um, let's start off with our, our fighter who has, bless, make sure I pick up that 
that four-sided dice. Roll it. I only got a three. Oh, it's going to be bad. I rolled a four on the four-sided dice, so that's seven, plus my modifier, which is a plus five for the great axe. So seven plus five is 12. Is 12 enough? Yes, it is. 12 is greater than 11, which is the armor class of an ogre. Yes, I know an ogre has a low armor class. So you strike the target. Good thing I had that bless. If I didn't have my, then my bless, it wouldn't have made it through. And I managed to hit by rolling a three on a 20-sided dice. That's how great that, uh, that particular spell is. So grab your, your big dice, the 12, and uh, make your attack. Okay, I only rolled a three. A little bit unfortunate, but never mind. Three plus three is three is the modifier for my damage, so that's a total of six. So the ogre takes six damage. It's on 18. Yeah, so reduce it by six. Comes down to a grand 12. Oh, thank God I can do some maths, right? Okay, here we go. We're getting there. Slowly but surely, things are starting to develop. All right, so we're down to the bottom of the initiative order. We've had two rounds. We're now up to round three. Back up the top where the cleric is. What is the cleric going to do? I could cast a, uh, a spell that is a cantrip. I only have three to choose from. Or I could cast myself a first level spell and try to heal somebody or do something else. I don't want to do that. I'm hoping that somebody will take some damage and I'll have an opportunity to use something like Cure Wounds or Healing Word. But um, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. I'm just, just praying. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, presto, what's that? Uh, you can DM for me any time with rolls like that. That's exactly what my players keep saying to me. If you keep rolling really bad with your monsters, man, we keep coming back. What's that, Eric? On flanking, monsters having uh, conditional abilities creates opportunities for players to be creative in countering. Yes, and when their attempts to counter succeed, then that's a win and fun. Yeah, true. Um, but I, I always have the opinion when it comes to flanking, it's up to the group to decide if they're going to use the flanking rules. And the only reason I have chosen not to use the flanking rules is I've put it towards my players and said, look, if you have flanking, my monsters get flanking. Do you still want to use the flanking rules? And they've, they've said to me many, many times, no, we're not going to push our luck. If you're rolling advantage rather than a flat roll, I feel like you've got too, too much of a chance you might actually hit us. So they don't do it. Um, so I'm going to cast another Sacred Flame. Sacred Flame seemed to work pretty well last time on our Ogre. I'm going to also move back just a little bit because he's a little bit close. And uh, it's a Dexterity saving throw for the Ogre who's got like a minus one. So it's a good, good spell to use on them. It's a eight sided of dice and roll your... 20, I got a 19. Well, that's not good. Because the problem is when you save on a uh, sacred flame, it's no longer really called sacred flame. It's it's uh, it's called by my players sacred miss, okay? So 19 minus 1 is 18. And unfortunately, that's greater than the spell casting DC for our cleric, which is only a 13. So unfortunately, no sacred flame. Oh well, next. Moving on, I'll use something that's called Ray of Frost. I'm going to move around so I've got a better line of sight. And I'm going to go 1, 2, so 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. So that's a pretty good line of sight. Ray of Frost, it's got the range. And we're going to make an attack roll. The attack roll for our, our wizard is only a plus 5, but it's, it should be fine. It's also got that bless going. Remember the four sided dice? So roll that dice. I got an 8 plus 2 is a grand total of 10, plus the 5 for my attack roll for my spell is 10 plus 5 is 15. Okay, the brain is working real slow today. Uh, and then we grab our, our dice for the Ray of Frost. Ray of Frost is only an 8-sided dice. It's a cantrip. You don't add any modifiers to it whatsoever. Just roll that dice, and whatever you get is what you get. It will also slow the creature by 10 feet if it tries to move. All right, I got, an, I got a seven. Woohoo! Okay, the wizard launches their uh, their ray of frost and starts to freeze the ogre where it stands. So it's currently on 12 hit points. Deduct seven gives us a grand total of five hit points. There we go, like so, and done. 
So the Wizards had a good good show. It's now time for our Rogue. And you can see, and I'll bring back the, the four-sided dice. As you can see, that Bless at the beginning of combat, being the first spell that you cast, has made a huge difference for the su success of this battle. Even if they didn't have Surprise. Okay, it's the Rogue's turn. It's up to the Rogue to decide whether they want to get out of there, bug out, or continue on with the attack. They have sneak attack they just need to hit they have bless so there's a good chance so we're going to go with the attack with a short sword for those of you who are wondering well, what what rogue are you talking about it's the rogue behind the ogre that you can't see see ogre behind all right so he's attacking somebody is within five foot so you get your sneak attack damage so that's uh six for the short sword and the sneak attack is a d6 as well okay Roll the attack. I rolled a 19. Wow, man, I'm rolling too well for these players. Okay, 19 plus 2, 21, plus the modifier for our short sword is 5, so that 26. 26 is way more than the armor class of an ogre at 11. So we can roll some damage now. Let's get rid of that dice. There's a few dice in the way. Put that back there so I remember I don't need to use that just yet. And we roll our damage. So I got a 4 plus a 1. And then we add our damage from our short sword, which is plus three, five, eight, eight damage. And unfortunately, the ogre has only got five hit points. So that means it's going to be reduced to zero hit points. That means the rogue over here, the rogue, the one that's behind the ogre, behind the ogre, has a choice. You do not have to kill the target when it is reduced to zero hit points. If you're using a, a melee, melee, melee weapon, um, I'm up in close quarter combat, up close I can make the choice. It could be a death blow that I make, or I can knock them out. And in this case, I'm going to have our little halfling uh, flip the, uh, the side of the blade on its, um, onto the flat and knock out the, uh, the ogre by uh, ghoulying it. So striking it in the ghoulies, and it passes out. Okay? Right. That's it. Well done. Well done, little halfling. Awesome. That was successful. Um, so today there was no death. There was no death, but why did I have the halfling knock out the ogre? Because wherever it came from, it probably knows some information. And uh, once you tie it up and um, it becomes conscious... It's something that you can talk to, even if it's pretty stupid. You should be able to get maybe, hopefully, a little bit of information out of it. Um, otherwise, you can dispatch it later on if you don't get the information you want. And that is probably it. There's not too much to it. That's, um, that's how you run a, a combat. And as you can see, we didn't even complete three rounds. This is quite common at first level. Often the combats will last one or two rounds and at the most, maybe three rounds. And if they go beyond that, usually uh, there's a few characters getting knocked down or killed. So, and as you can see, this was not a really tough battle. Four, four characters faced one ogre with a challenge rating of two. So, and it did fine. Perfectly fine. They, 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 they were successful. So look, if you found this video helpful or informative, Please share and like the video and I can see a whole bunch of people have joined in and, uh, and gave, given me the thumbs up. Uh, but look, if you think it was not really a very good uh, live stream, then you let me know. Don't just give me a thumbs down, tell me why. Okay? I'm going to stick around and answer a few questions, so if you're in a live chat right now, don't run away because I'm still going to be here for just a little while to answer any questions okay, that you might have. Uh, if you want to uh, really support me, then subscribe to my channel if you haven't already subscribed to my channel. And hit the bell button to be notified when I go live. And I go live almost every day. Not every single day, but almost every single day. I do a video every day. And on top of that, I, uh, I publish uh, new videos. And you, when you hit the bell button, it'll notify you when I'm live and when I publish new videos. I've got about 500 of them. So if you want to support me, Watching this video and this live stream supported me right now. Watching more of my videos is going to be really helpful. There is another workshop, a number one and a number two. And you're welcome to go back and have a look at those if you want. Different situations and scenarios. 
Um, yes, uh, so watching my videos, I get AdSense revenue, that's really helpful. Uh, I don't do Patreon, but I do have an affiliate link down in the description where you can buy stuff online from the book depository or Amazon, and I get a small commission. You pay exactly the same price as you normally would online, and you don't even have to buy the thing that it's linked to. And I'm currently an Amazon influencer or something like that. So um, yes, you should be able to see my recommended products up reasonably shortly. I might even include that in this video later on, so you can check it out if you want. Uh, and those will only be products that I deem to be good for everybody. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. I'm not just putting down absolutely everything that Wizards of the Coast has published. Uh, so that's, that's part of it. Uh, if you have any questions, the live chat is the place to start asking those questions. Otherwise, if you're not part of the live stream, then hey, you can ask your questions, give your feedback, disagree with me, agree with me. Uh, give me a scenario, whatever it is that you think I might be able to help you with. You can put that down in the comments if you're not part of the live stream. I often will answer questions unrelated to the video that I'm doing. So for those of you who thought I will only answer questions on combat, or only on the Dungeon Master stuff, or only on the player stuff, that is simply not true. And since I managed to survive this video, the chances are we will have another type of video like this in the future. Uh, okay, so that is covered pretty much everything, and hey, till next time, keep rolling those 20s. Now in my case, probably like a 1 or a 2, maybe even a 3. Okay, I'm not gone, I'm still here, and um, let's uh, have a look at the chat box and have a discussion before I disappear. Uh, we're running up close to one, 1 hour, I don't want to be too long in this video. But I will absolutely uh, do more of these sorts of things in the future. I've made sure I've already got my OBS um, studio ready to pump out more of them when, when people indicate that they really like them. If you indicate that they're useful to you and a lot of people watch them, then I do more. That's how it works. All right, what have we got here? Uh, presto, bug out and let the, uh, the fighters kill it. And <laughs> the fighter killer. Well, you know, you could have the rogue um, bug out and, and, and do that, but I've found <laughs> that there's a kind of a competitive element to um, the players sometimes at my table. And that would have been the smart move because it's much more likely that the fighter could survive a blow from an ogre, should it have hit, than uh, the rogue. But honestly, if the ogre had ever struck even once, it would have taken down one of the characters, including the fighter, because it does so much damage. So, yes. But it would have been the smart move for the rogue to, to bug out. And for those of you who can't see the rogue, this one here. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, Aaron, what do you got here? Um, playing without flanking would put uh, players at a disadvantage at low levels if the creatures had abilities like pack tactics, gnolls, kabolds, wolf. Yes, it would. Um, but also bear in mind that uh, you, you're also dealing with a huge advantage, huge advantage for the Dungeon Master by having flanking as an option. Um, not that many creatures have pack tactics, and kobolds aren't often going to be using pack tactics simply because getting up close isn't what kobolds do. They set traps. Gnolls might get up close, that's a bit different. Uh, the wolf will get up close, and usually in a pack, in a group, and, and try to tear down one character at a time. Um, that's certainly, certainly true. But I still feel like it's a choice that you allow your players to make. There's nothing wrong with using variant rules. That's fine. Not an issue. I have no issue with that whatsoever. What I do have an issue with is deciding that you should play a particular way because the rule is there. You don't have to use all the rules. In fact, sometimes it's smart to take some of the rules away. And I often do that. Um, Alright, here we go. Presto, he's dead. Rest in peace, ugly. Well, he's not dead, he's unconscious. <laughs> you like it? I'm glad you do. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Eric, when you say, then the monsters can also flank, what tactics have you seen and allowed to let PCs counter the flanking, or is it a case of monsters are flanking, suck it? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. 
Yeah, if if the if the monsters can flank, the players can and players can flank the monsters. And um, I'm I I don't like the uh, Coupe de Grace. Uh, it was um, an ugly mechanic, and there's enough in the game right now that will allow you to um, make two attacks, and you're probably you know a downed character who's dying but not dead. You only need to make two attacks, and particularly if it's up close with a melee weapon and you're going to probably kill them you're going to get an advantage because they're prone once you strike it's counted as a critical because you're within five foot um, and there has been some discussion about whether you can be within five foot and shoot with a bow if they are unconscious or on zero hit points and die uh, just shoot down with a bow as long as you're within five foot it doesn't actually specify that it needs to be a melee attack it just says within five foot i think I could be wrong. Somebody will correct me, I'm sure. Um, yes. All right, presto. Uh, my players work well with with knowing the, with knowing the elements. I think they know every monster they kill takes a bit of my soul. Uh, they work as a team to um, to <laughs> uh, despite despite me. Hey, look. Um, I I've I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again. You're the dungeon master. Your monsters sh don't have to be run as they are in the monster manual. You know, the monster manual is, you know, when we were alpha play testing it, we really only got very short periods of time to test the final result. And, and all of my feedback was that my group who were playing at level five and six could pretty much cremate anything. Um, they could deal with almost everything. And they didn't give us a challenge rating for these monsters. And then suddenly I get, when it's published, I see the challenge rating. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, heck, how's that going to work? Um, the level 5 character is going to crush that. So, yeah, I would, I, would, um, I would change your monsters. Yeah, make them a bit more dangerous. Change them. What I like about the uh, Tome of Beasts, and I've done a review on that particular um, book. It's uh, made by Cabal Press. And when you do hit point damage, your monsters do hit point damage, or reduce hit points if it's not doing damage. Remember, hit point loss is not always about damage. Sometimes they're not actually physical injury. Sometimes it's just wearing them down. Um, there's also some sort of condition. There's a saving throw. So you reduce hit points, and there's a saving throw, whether that be strength, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, whatever, dexterity. And there's some, some other effects taking place. That's what makes monsters so interesting is giving them something other than the ability to reduce the hit points of the player's characters. I just need a drink of water, guys. Uh, all right, here we go. I'm now really curious, um, Eric, about the message you retracted. Okay, uh, so tactics like using narrow corridors, um, tight packed shield walls, standing near pillars, etc. Well, yeah, There's, look, you as the dungeon master should be using those tactics and so should the players. All of that will work. And I've done so many videos on player tactics and dungeon master tactics and I will continue to do them. And you guys will continue to correct me when I make a mistake and when I miss something so that everybody benefits. Uh, Josh Clark, how's it going, Josh? Uh, have played through Storm King's Thunder. If if so, how is it for new DMs? Okay, I've only DM'd part of it. I was playing it, but my shift changed and I'm unable to play with my home group anymore. Um, I DM tonight for a different group, but it's not Storm King's Thunder. Um, I found Storm King's Thunder, like many of the Wizards of the Coast books, to be painful. Um, hard to navigate through. It's a little bit better than some of them. Some of them are awful. Some of them are just diabolical but it's still uh, painful there's pages and pages of information i have to read it's the sort of uh, story that i don't recommend for new dungeon masters if i was going to recommend anything to a new dungeon master i would recommend something like the book of lairs which is a cabal press book and it's short adventures that you can string together yourself and they are about four or five pages long and each one is like a, a mini adventure, which is kind of cool. Designed for different levels, so they're not all at the set at the same level. Uh, also, there's the book called Prepared, a dozen short adventures. 
and that is for Dungeons and Dragons 5e as well. It's full of one page adventures, maybe two page adventures sometimes. And literally it's designed so you can put it all together in five minutes. It's easy for a new dungeon master to get their head around. It's not hugely complicated, you don't have to remember a lot of stuff. And even if you forget stuff, it's easy enough to read through and see what's going on. I highly recommend them. If you haven't, Josh, if you haven't used something like The Lost Mine of Fandelver, uh, The Lost Mine of Fandelver is an excellent adventure, but still more complicated than the ones that I just talked about. Um, if you're going to play one of the bigger books that uh, are available from Wizards of the Coast, I would suggest Tales from the Yawning Portal, because it's made up of shorter adventures that you can string together. Uh, the only one I would have concerns with, in terms of you running it, if you're a new dungeon master, is definitely got to be Dead and Thay. Dead and Thay is a super dungeon and it's going to be rough to run. It's so complicated, there's so many locations. Um, I would, would not recommend running that particular adventure myself. Otherwise, something like even the Curse of Strahd is better laid out than most of the other adventures. Um, the only problem you're going to have is when you get to the castle. The castle is like, it's a maze. It's really hard to work with. And I've run uh, the original Ravenloft, so I know what I'm talking about. And I've also run Curse of Strahd. Uh, okay, Aaron. I think um, SKT would be tougher because you start... Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Uh, would be tougher because you start your players would start higher with a lot more mechanics and spells. Okay. Um, Aaron, what do you mean by SKT? I'm not entirely sure what that abbreviation is supposed to mean. Uh, they start the module at a higher level. Yes, yes, start. Yep, why not? Start the module at a higher level. Absolutely, that can certainly help, particularly if you're concerned. Um, Storm King's Thunder is a little bit tough at times. But really, you know, if you have a big enough party, it's not going to be a problem. If it starts shrinking down to three players, then, then you, you, you're going to hit problems later on. Particularly when you're dealing with the, the big battles that, that uh, involve giants, and you're, and you're not fighting something like a hill giant. All the other giants can be a lot more dangerous. Okay, um, presto. At level 5, you really start adding more monsters. You have to add uh, quantity over quality. I, I don't agree. Um, I know you can. That will certainly help. But you can add a lot of other stuff at level 5 to compensate for their power level. Uh, and I've done it many times. The environment is one thing, adding in traps. Uh, also, you can pump up the, uh, the level of your monster. I've just demonstrated today that a group of level 1 characters can take down a challenge 2 monster. Okay? It, granted, it was a solo creature. Solo creatures always do badly. They always do, because they, they're the only thing attacking, and it had to contend with four other attacks. And on top of that, I'd cast Bless. So that's a lot more difficult. If there'd been Surprise, the uh, the Ogre wouldn't have even had a chance, which is why I tried to avoid doing that. Aaron, I like the Horde of the Dragon Queen. It's uh, a little railroady through, pushing your characters to stay on one trail. Yes, it very much is. I don't have a problem with uh, episode 1, 2, or 3, or even the final chapter. I do not like the episodes 4 and onward. It drove me nuts, and I, I need to finish doing the DM reviews for those. Or should I say DM guides? DM guides, not reviews. I've done a review on it. Um, but yeah, Horde of the Dragon Queen, it's an option. I don't personally like it myself, but Aaron, if you, it, it is simple to run. Granted, you know, there's only a few chapters um, there's only eight chapters to deal with and there's only a few pages in most of the chapters it's a fairly thin book it's not 256 pages and yeah generally you can run that without too much trouble the only chapter that's a little bit tricky is the very first one um, and I would say the very last chapter those are quite difficult the one that involves the castle uh, in the middle, I can't I can't remember the name of it. It's got lizard folk and bollywogs. That's a little bit complicated, but other than that, it's pretty easy. Um, but still, I don't I don't like Court of the Dragon Queen. I never really did. Uh, Josh Clark, 
Awesome advice, thanks. Midway through my first adventure, I lost mine of Fandela. Excellent. Yes, that's the one. Run that. Run that baby. And when you finish with the uh, Lost Mine of Fandalva, try and pick up something like um, Tales from the Yawning Portal to continue on with. Or you could go with those books that I just mentioned. Uh, the Book of Lairs and Prepared. I still think are excellent, easy to pre prepare, easy to run for a new Dungeon Master. Okay. Greenest. Yeah, Greenest and Flames, but then no, there's another one. In the middle of Horde of the Dragon Queen, there's another castle that doesn't involve cabals and cultists and so forth. But yeah, that's uh, that's my advice. Okay, I'm going to have to call it quits here, guys. We are running long now, and I think that's pretty much covered all of the details that you might have had. Look, it's not like this is the only one that I will ever do. If you guys indicate with a thumbs up and in the comments... Uh, that I need to do more of these, then I will do more. And Aaron and everybody else, thank you for coming. And Aaron, you are absolutely welcome. I'm glad I could be of some help. And uh, yeah, I am going to say good night and, well, good day. Because it's not night yet, but it's heading that way. I'll see you later.